So uh, in contrast to most of the previous speakers who are working, who, who tend to be largely from the high energy physics background, I'm from uh, engineering in electrical and computer engineering, and I'm uh, one of the students of uh, Dr. Tang Seng Yi, who has spoken earlier on this morning about uh, the applications of gauge physics in theoretical applied in a theoretical applied physics. So my talk will be a bit of continuation and elaboration on some of the topics that he has spoken about earlier. Uh, so, um, okay, so just going to offer you some background on why and what context we are looking at. Uh, my group is actually working in the field of spintronics. So in the field of spintronics, uh, what we mean to do is to make use of this spin degree of freedom of charge carriers. So in conventional electronics, what we do is we make use of the charge degree of freedom of your um, electrons and holes. So here, instead of making use of moving charges, what we aim to do is to instead make use of spin. So what we use spin to do is to store information, to process information, and to transmit information. So one of the things that, you have, uh, one of the applications of spintronics that is already in the market right now is probably the read mechanism that you can find in every single hard disk read head. So this makes use of the property that your spin polarized current uh, has a different resistance depending on whether it's flowing to a ferromagnetic material that is magnetized parallel or anti-parallel to the spin, magnet spin polarization of the current. So what I do mean by the spin polarization of a current is that if you have a uh, fixed quantization axis, for example, here I put the quantization axis as up or down, and in most materials that you find in real life, this quantization axis is defined by the direction of the external magnetic field. In your device. So here, you know, most of the time, uh, oh, sorry, because this is a bad diagram, but what I wanted to show was that in most materials, if you don't do anything special to it, then you will actually have a number of um, electrons that are polarized in the spin up direction being equal to the number of electrons polarized in the spin down direction, so there is no net spin polarization. However, since we want to make use of spin, so one of the main things in spintronics is to try and make is to try and increase the number of, say, spin up electrons relative to the number of spin down electrons so that we can generate what we call a spin polarized current. So there are many mechanisms to generate spin polarization, but uh, and, uh, one of the more traditional ones is to pass the charge carriers through a ferromagnetic materials, but that is uh, not very good from the application's point of view because for one thing, it's hard to include ferromagnets into your conventional CMOS technology that we actually build electronic devices from. So the other thing that we could do is to make use of other physical effects present in these systems. So one interesting physical effect that the applied physicists have been looking at is to make use of what is called the spin hall effect, which Dr. Tan has mentioned a bit earlier about. So what this spin hall effect thing is about is basically that if you have a charge current, which I represent as flowing in through this material, and this material has spin orbit interactions, then what you will discover is that with the passage of a charged current, you will have a, char a spin current that flows perpendicular to the direction of this. So Dr. Tan mentioned something about this unitary transformation and gauge uh, theory in trying to explain this emergence of the spin current, so I'll go a little bit more into that. But first I'll move on to talk about the motivation of my current talk. So in, um, in the field of spintronics, there are a few new emerging materials such as silicon, molybdenum sulfide, and crystalline topological insulators, etc., where you have a degree of freedom that has a discrete number of states that is coupled to your real spin degree of freedom. So collectively, we call all of these uh, discrete states that are, that are coupled to your spin as a pseudo spin. So like uh, in more of these emerging materials, for example, molybdenum sulfide and silicon, these materials have a crystalline uh, have a hexagon crystalline structure that looks like this. So um, for both of this, in this sort of honeycomb structure, you have two equivalent lattices, which are labeled, can be labeled as A and B. So this A and B uh, can be give rise to this thing called a pseudospin that mathematically looks like a spin in the fact that you can represent it as a poly matrix. So in this uh, example, Hamiltonian, for example, is represented as tau. And um, this pseudo spin degree of freedom is actually coupled to your real spin uh, in uh, spintronics usually denoted by as sigma. So these are in the one of more new, more, fangle, uh, more new emerging materials coming up. But we also have more traditional uh, semiconductor materials that, are being, that have been considered for use in tra traditional electronics applications. So um, in more of this, so many of these more traditional materials can be described by what is called the Lattinger Hamiltonian in the field of condensed matter physics. So for example, so in this Lattinger Hamiltonian, what we have is that 
instead of the coupling of your real spin to a pseudo spin, you have a coupling of the spin half of the charge carriers to your spin one of your um, orbital angular momentum of your charge carriers. So, um, for example, if you oops, so if you write out the Lachinger Hamiltonian, basically it looks like this. So you have your k, which is your crystal momentum, and you have a k dot s. So this s here is a spin three over two operator, and basically this spin three over two comes from the coupling of your spin half of the charge carriers to the l equals to one part of your orbital angular momentum. So this is a three by two matrix, a three three by three matrix, and uh, it gives rise to the energy bands in semiconductor materials that are of practical interest. So these bands are usually called what we call the light hole band, the heavy hole band, and a spin split off band here. So in spintronics, what we are interested in is more we are often more interested in the spin degree of freedom than the orbital angular momentum degree of freedom. And the reason for this is because we make use of magnetic materials. So when you apply magnetization in a device such as, for example, this, this uh, multi-layer stack that Dr. Tan has shown in his slides, um, the Hamiltonian is often has the form of an M dot sigma. So, sigma. so M is your external magnetization and sigma is the real spin. And your angular orbital momentum is not involved in this. So this motivates us to ask the question of whether we could treat this uh, real spin in this S as a and a and the orbital angular momentum as separately. So we so philosophically we are treating the angular momentum as a pseudo spin coupled to your real spin of your charge carriers in this. So how we go about doing this is that we could actually try and um, break this S spin three over two up into a spin one component co corresponding to your orbital angular momentum and a half spin half component corresponding to your real spin. And the way we break it up is to exploit the fact that this spin three over two operate, uh, spin over two, spin three over two states here um, can in fact be broken up as a sum of, as a linear combination of spin one states and spin half states using the clash gordon coefficients here. So if we make use of this here, then we can actually rewrite your spin three over two operators here, as, which I denote as S, as a linear combination of your um, orbital angular momentum operator in for the x, y, and z direction coupled to your spin uh, angular momentum operator in also your x, y, z direction, which are multiplied by a few coefficients. So if we actually do this basis transformation here, then um, this whole lot here can actually be broken up into a angular uh, the orbital angular momentum part that's around here, 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 and that, and that is multiplying something that is your spin angular momentum part, which are denoted by what this sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. So this, in fact, then tells you that these guys here look and behave very much like effective magnetic fields that are acting on your spin degree of freedom here, here, and here. So then the next part of this is that these guys here are operators. So how am I going, how am I going to actually cast them into a form that look like an effective magnetic field here. So what I want to do is to make sure all of these things of operators here into a single number here so that this whole lot emits the physical interpretation of an effective magnetic field. And the most straightforward way to do it is actually to just take oops, the expectation values of these guys with respect to, your, to the eigenstates of your Lattinger Hamiltonian. So if I go through this exercise, then what I discovered is that for the heavy hole states, um, you end up with an effective magnetic field that does not depend on your momentum in the z direction, so it's not interesting, and, and it's only the uh, light hole states that give rise to something that's more interesting, because uh, in this case, you can actually cast your effective magnetic field in this form here. So this has a dependence on kx squared in your x component and kx multiplied by ky in the y component, and it's this momentum dependence that gives rise to a spin hole effect. So one of the main, so how does a, momentum dependence in the effective magnetic field give rise to the spin hole effect. Uh, so Dr. Tan has mentioned something, so I'll try and elaborate more on this. So what the physical picture you can think of is that if you have a, oops, have a position, a momentum dependent magnetic field like this, so this depends on your k parameter, what you can think of it is that it assigns a value of your effective magnetic field to every single point in k space. So what I've done here is to put out k space and to draw out the direction of your magnetic of your effective magnetic field at every single point. So next, you consider that you have a particle that has a certain value of momentum initially, say here, and you apply an electric field to the x direction. So if you apply an electric field in the x direction, then you expect that the momentum of your charge carriers to change along this, say, along this line here. And if your electric field is 
weak enough and acceleration is slow enough, then you can invoke what we call the adiabatic approximation in synchronics, which says that if as the direction of the effective magnetic field changes, the spin polarization of your charge carriers change along as well. So in this case then, oops, if your charge carriers goes from here to here, then you notice that the spin actually rotates. So what I've done in this part here is to carry out and draw a zoom out view of this. So you can see that there's a rotation of the spin and this rotation of the spin can be interpreted as being resulting from the um, out, of field mag out of plane magnetic field that's pointing out of the plane of this thing, uh, of this diagram here. So this out of the plane magnetic field gives two effects. First, it causes a rotation of the spins and second, it gives rise to a out of, so out of the plane spin polarization as well. So that's why in your spin hole effect, you will actually see a out of plane spin polarization. So this is the physical intuitive picture, but how can it be done, be seen mathematically is, and, and how this is related to gauge views actually is that we can actually carry out um, some mathematical steps. So essentially, if you start with a Hamiltonian that describes a basic spin or interaction, uh, momentum dependent spin or interaction field here, then this is your momentum dependent spin interaction field and you have an electric field around here. So what we want to do is to try and make this thing diagonal in the spin degree of freedom. So in order to do this, we make use of a unitary transformation here. So what this unitary transformation here does is that it will just carry out a rotation of your spin axis so that your spin axis, so that this field points along the z spin z direction. So essentially we are trying to diagonalize this. So if we carry out this unitary transformation, then essentially what it does is that this R position operator um, does not commute with your position, with your momentum dependent unitary transform. So you end up with an additional term around here. Okay, so what this additional term around here looks like is that since it, it also contains a part that points along your spin direction here. So if we then evoke what we call the adiabatic approximation, so we only keep the diagonal parts of this term. So uh, physically, this corresponds to the fact that your spins won't jump from one eigenstate to the other, from one spin eigenstate to the other eigenstate. So if you only examine the diagonal components of this and you rotate it back to that frame, then what you'll notice is they actually end up with an effective magnetic field that looks like this. So this field here points in the direction that is perpendicular to both your original magnetic field as well as proportional to a whatever value that you vary it by. So in the context of the original um, Duttinger Hamiltonian and the light states that we got earlier, we end up with a field that looks like this. So this has a very neat form of like k over k squared cross e. I haven't done the uh, integration over the Fermi's surface of it, but this just show that probably we can end up with a spin z polarization even if you have a Duttinger Hamiltonian. So this concludes my talk. Thank you. <laughs>